And then can you, if John and Mayara are in there, can you make Mara, Mayara the host? Okay, here, let me see. I'm gonna uh, remote to panel. Oh, wait, so Mayara to yes. panelist. Okay, and then... Okay, wait, John, I think I, yeah, just moved you. And Clayton too. Clayton, okay. And then... And then there's Daniel Mendoza in there. I don't know if that um, he's part of the meeting. Let me see, the applicant is... He's Mark, Mark Max. Mark Max, yes. And I was just dialing and then this popped up, so just... John, are you talking to us or so? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think we have everybody now. Yeah, sorry, I was on the phone with the applicant trying to get logged in, so. Sorry about any technical delays today, everybody. All right, so do we have everybody? Okay. We have, we have everyone from the city side. Um, I'm assuming, do we want to have Mark moved over as the applicant, Aubrey. Yeah, give me a second. I just want to make sure he wasn't expecting if he didn't have somebody else that he was planning on attending with him as well. Okay, Mark, if you can please turn on your camera. And once you have that on, we are ready to go. Trying to figure out how to 
do the camera on this format. Oh, here it is. Okay. It should be here down on the left hand corner. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, welcome to the Salt Lake City Planning Division Appeals Hearing for August 15th, 2024. My name is Clayton Priest. I'm the hearing officer for this evening. We have one matter on the docket, which is case number PLNAPP 2024-00687, which is the appeal of an administrative interpretation at approximately 617 South, 1200 East. And can I have the parties just for the record make their appearance? So who's here on behalf of the property owner or the appellant? I'm, I'm here representing myself. And for the city? So I'm John Anderson, I'm a planning manager. Um, I'm gonna be representing Brooke Olson. She's um, out of town today. And then of and course we have- I'm Catherine Pasker from the Salt Lake City Attorney's Office. I'm here for any more, shall we say, technical legal questions. <laughs> right. And I'm, I'm Sony Administrator Meyer Lima, so. And I'll note that this was noticed for a public hearing. There is a public comment that's included as part of the staff report. And I, given the introductions that were made, I don't see any other members of the public that are trying to participate via this meeting. But if somebody does join, please let me know. So and there is one attendee in, um, on the list, and we will give them the opportunity to speak okay. um, once the public hearing is open. Okay. So the, the way that this will proceed is the appellant, you'll have the opportunity to speak first, the city will have an opportunity, and then we'll open the public, we'll open the hearing to the public, members of the public will have a very limited opportunity to raise anything that they would like, and then we'll let the appellant and the city, if necessary, provide any closing remarks. I have read everything that's been submitted in the with the staff report, I've looked at all of the attachments. So you, you don't need to go back through each of those things. I'd like you to focus on, uh, particularly focus on the dwelling unit and the nature of that unit, what it looks like. That's most of my questions have to do with that. If well, we're gonna limit both sides to 30 minutes, that should be ample time. But if for whatever reason, as you're going through that, if you feel like you need additional time, um, once you hit that 30 minute mark, I'd just like you to give me a brief synopsis of what additional information that you feel needs to be presented. And then we can I'll, I'll make a decision as to whether or not additional time is warranted. So with that, uh, the appellant, you can go ahead. Yeah, I've got uh, two pages as well, so it shouldn't take very long. I appreciate everybody uh, for the opportunity to be heard. Um, I do want to give a little bit of background. Uh, my wife and I bought our first home on this street in 1984, and we love living in this neighborhood and have raised our family here. Uh, when we first moved in, we noticed that during the summer months, there were only a few green lawns on the street and that some properties needed improving. Some were party houses. Our siblings encouraged us to move away out to the suburbs where they lived and get away from what they called the ghetto. Uh, one of the best uh, one of the best decisions that we ever made uh, as a wa my wife and I was to put down roots here and to invest in this neighborhood. We began to buy other properties on our street and in the neighborhood and uh, to improve the properties. We participate in the city's good landlord program. Uh, we screen tenants and ensure that they obey city ordinances such as no noise after 10 p.m., etc. We have installed automatic sprinkling systems and or put in Zero scaping on every property and ensure that yards and properties are well maintained. We have evicted tenants that cause nuisances such as noise after 10. Some of our tenants have lived in our properties for more than 30 years. I also served as the chair president of the Utah Housing Coalition and am very sensitive to the need for affordable housing. And I'm grateful that the city is making progress on this front with the new ADU and affordable housing policies. I continue to work with the IRC, CRS, Housing Connect, and other groups, and currently have tenants from these programs who need affordable but well-maintained units. We also have served in our neighborhood community councils and helped uh, come up with a solution to the unique parking issues in our neighborhood and have reduced some of the impact by leasing some units 
to tenants without vehicles. In 1995, the city down zoned, as you know, many neighborhoods, including ours, and I was the chair of the Salt Lake uh, Board of Realtors Government Affairs Committee at the time. And we cautioned the city that by doing so, it might create taking issues with future property owners. Uh, this subject property is, is just a, such a case, in my opinion. Uh, as evidenced by the three existing meter bases and circuit breaker boxes, this property once had three electric meters and they have three separate uh, circuit breaker boxes. One goes to the, the static studio, uh, which is only accessible from the rear of the property. One goes to the main floor, two bedroom, one bath unit, and one goes to the basement, two bedroom, one bath unit. As neighbors of this property for over 40 years, we can attest, as can others of our neighbors, some of whom have written affidavits, that there have been multiple families living in this property consistently since then. We have worked well with the city in the past 40 years regarding unit legalization issues and have improved subject properties to ensure public safety and parking needs. The rub on this property is an issue with a former owner who signed a statement that she did not rent out the basement unit while living there and that the property was a single family home. We did not know this when we bought the property and were shocked to find this out. Her husband, whom she married after making this statement, agreed to write an affidavit stating that he and his wife rented out the basement unit while living there. I guess that his family, that his wife informed him of what she had done previously and they decided to ghost us and did not provide the promised affidavit. We did secure affidavits from tenants who rented from her while she and her husband lived there. My son who bought the property from her also lived in and rented out the other units and was in the process of legalizing the units when they decided to move to Virginia for his wife to attend medical school. We bought the property from my son in 2020 and we have made no changes to the house since purchasing the property. The city notified me that our son had formally stopped the unit legalization process and promised not to rent the other units. When I asked my son about this, he said he, that he did no such thing, that he had reached out to the city several times regarding the next steps and didn't hear back. He has submitted an affidavit on this and is participating. He was going to join us in this, this uh, hearing. I'm not sure if he's tried yet or not. Uh, but he said that he's be, he'd be available if we need to get further clarification. And basically, that's all I have for right now. Uh, we just appreciate the opportunity and hope we can find a, a positive win-win solution for this property. So I have a few questions for you. Can you explain to me how the units are separated from each other in the, in the home? Sure. The, uh, the main floor unit, you come in from the front door and there's two bedrooms, one bath, and a kitchen that has a side door. And then there are stairs that go down to the, the shared laundry room with the basement tenant. The front garage door that, that would normally be where the garage is, that accesses the basement unit. And there's two bedrooms and one bathroom and a kitchen. And there also is the shared access to the shared bath, uh, shared laundry that they share with the main floor tenants. The attic studio unit is only accessible from the back. And it's only one door that goes into the upstairs. And they have a little kitchenette and a bathroom and it's just a studio, so it's not very big. Um, and we do not allow any tenants up there that have cars, nor do we in the basement. Uh, and so they one for many years, we had a guy that lived upstairs with a motorcycle and he would park the motorcycle up by the garbage cans inside uh, on the property side of the sidewalk. So he wasn't on city property. He lived there for many years and his mom actually lived in one of our other units. And I, my wife and I just barely got back from, from church service in Peru for the last couple of years. And my son has been managing our property, the one that used to own it, uh, long distance from Oregon. And so I'm not exactly sure who are the tenants exactly that live in each of the units right now, but we can get a hold of him and find out all the details. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, the the studio that's in the attic that's completely separated you couldn't enter another portion of the house right. from the unit right but the the main level and basement units would be connected via the shared laundry room you could correct. go through the shared laundry room okay correct you know 
you said you've not made any modifications to the house since you purchased it. No, I have not made any modifications since we purchased it in 2020. Now, presumably there were at some point some modifications made to, to turn this from a traditional single family into these multiple units. I believe that you know I was happened? told that uh, in 19, I think it was 1987, that someone who lived there earlier actually made, got a permit to enclose the garage and to finish the basement apartment. The, the uh, pictures of the um, three different uh, circuit breakers, that's on the uh, access to the attic. It's right inside the door to the left of the door that goes up to the studio unit. And then the three meters uh, bases are right outside that same door uh, that goes up to the attic. So let's talk about the, the three meters for a second. Do you have any indication when that was changed from three meters to one meter? I actually asked an electrician to come and see about restoring the meters because I wanted to have each of the units be responsible for their own electric use. And he went down to the city and that's when I guess some of this problem came up is that that they somebody he said that somebody had taken two of the meters out and had redirected the the uh, electric meters down through the one meter. And but then it separates right back out into the circuit breaker boxes. So there's three circuit breaker boxes right after the, the third meter. But did, did he give you any indication though of, of when that appeared to have happened? Um, no, he said that that the work was well done and it was done uh, the right way, but he did not know or estimate when it was in. And this this electrician that went down to the city to try to get the permit to put it back in or something, basically didn't didn't get back with us. And I figured that that was probably because it was not possible for him to get a permit to reestablish those two meters. With the three units, those each each have an independent kitchen. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So that, that that's all the questions I have. Anything else that you'd like to add? No, I, I think uh, the only other issue that Brooke brought up, by the way, Brooke's been very good to work with, um, is that in trying to find some Polk research to find the number of people living in there, uh, it was a little difficult to find them during a, a certain period of time. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I do have, I have had problems with Polk research in the past. For example, uh, I've done unit legalizations on probably maybe eight or 10 properties. And many times I find that there, that the people that live in these units do not put their change their permanent address. They just come and stay there for a while and they never put an address there. In fact, in some of the Polk pages, it has me living in three different units the same year. And that's because we're the owners of record. And I've talked to the city about this a little bit, that when you go back nearly 30 years, trying to find an owner, a previous owner, is almost impossible because of death or incapacitation. And I'm wondering if there's some other way that we can try to remedy this so that it's not such an issue. But I did find that there was a couple of times where there was two different people living in the property. Um, I think one of them still had the same phone number though, at least landline. And so I think that created a little bit of issue for the staff. But that's why I provided at least two neighbors. And I do have a third neighbor that contacted me and said that they would also verify that there were multiple tenants living in this building for over 40 years. His name is Robert Morell and he lives across the street also. I think Carter Williams was actually gonna send some information to John yesterday and I'm not sure if he got that all in and if everything's good on that or not. Okay, um, we'll, we'll circle back to you. Go ahead and turn the time over to the city. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Brooke produced a huge record there. There's a lot of good information there, but I did want to make sure we did. I did receive an email from a neighbor. Of, uh, his name is Carter Williams. I'm looking online and I'm not seeing that it made it into our laser fish system. So I don't know if you received that or not yet. I've not received it. 
Okay. Um, if you'd like, I, we certainly can forward after this meeting, um, or I can read it into the record at the moment. It kind of whatever your preference is. How lengthy is it? It's two short little paragraphs. Um, let's, if you give us, just give me a, just general sense, uh, synopsis, if you will, of what it is. And then if you'll forward to it to me, we'll make sure that's included in the record, but I would like to see the original. Um, absolutely. So, um, it's a neighbor. He lives at 634 South 1200 East. He just wanted to say that he said that the property's had at least dual occupancy units, so at least two since at least 1995, lives across the street. So um, that's really quick synopsis. There's not a lot more there. We'll make sure that you have that for the record as well. Thank you. Um, but like I mentioned, I don't really want to take up a lot of time here because I think that the record is pretty, um, very, very detailed on this one. Um, I think it's important to first state that, you know, 1995 is not just a random date. Um, we use that date because the city had a citywide rezone. Um, prior to 1995, April 1995, you could basically have a, a duplex in almost any residential zone. And so there's a big down zone and push to that single family neighborhood. So that's the reason why we use this April 95. Um, you know, it's not all our research tools are flaw or are, are perfect. And we know that. I think in this time, we found a lot of people who could state that sure that someone had been there for quite some time. It was hard to get to that date prior to April 1995, that someone say, I can, I know that this happened at that date and since then. And I think that especially having the building permit where it clearly stated that this was a single family dwelling. And so with that, the city actually produces zoning certificate that states the same thing, that we recognized a single family dwelling since that time. Um, other than that, I didn't really want to rehash everything that went on in here because I think that the, like I mentioned, there's a lot of good detail already in there. And I know you've already probably spent a lot of time reading it, so. Thanks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So I do have a few questions, but yes. these, may, these may be more attorney questions. So we'll okay, let, let's uh, see. <laughs> Ms. Pastor, jump in. Um, but looking at the definition of dwelling, right, it says, among other things, that it's a self-contained unit. Is there a specific definition that the city uses for determining what constitutes a self-contained unit? Uh, the city, I, I have to look in our definitions a little bit more closely, but our essentially is you have to have a kitchen and a bathroom in addition to, you know, a, you know, a studio is fine, but you can't, a shared kitchen or shared bathrooms is not a self-contained unit. They have to be separate. Okay. So would a, would a, from the city's perspective, would a shared laundry room make those no. self-contained units? No, they would still be separate as long as, you know, we recognize there are many multi-unit apartment buildings around the city where, you know, there's shared laundry in the basement or something like that. Um, laundry isn't essential to our definition or, or articulation of what it is to have a dwelling. And I should mention also that, you know, having multiple kitchens in a home doesn't necessarily make for multiple units. Um, that happens a lot. People have a little kitchen in the basement or upstairs. But when we issue permits, we do make them basically state that they are not creating two separate units and there needs to be clear passageway between both units. So not two locked doors. And then it wasn't entirely clear to me from the staff report, and I want to make sure it's clear in the record, the, the standard of review that we're looking at this under my understanding is that this is a is a de novo review based on an administrative appeal, but or is this something that the city sees as being reviewed on on the record? No, this is a de novo review. Okay. Like I said, I just want to make sure that's clear in the record. And I'm not sure, you know, who the city would be best to address this, but there's a, a contention that the representation about a withdrawal of the the legalization is not accurate and see respond or shed any light on that. Um, I, I don't know that we can. Um, we didn't find anything on the record that said specifically that. Um, we have, we get a lot of requests for unit legalizations. It's, you know, something that happens all the time. Um, we generally would expect for them to continue to push for it. Um, we wouldn't necessarily continue to reach out to somebody if we're not receiving information back. Um, a lot of the same information, whether this was now or 10 years ago, the standards review haven't generally changed with those general standards that it was occupied before in 1995 and it's been continuously occupied at least once every five years since that date. 
And that, that seems to me to be the, the really the crux of this of this particular case is the longevity of the ownership and, and who was renting it as separate units. Yeah, I don't think there's an argument that there are three units there. I mean, I think that is 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 pretty clear. It's just when were they created? Um, were they created post-1995 when we wouldn't have allowed another unit on the property? Or did it occur prior to that time when um, regulations and standards are different? As part of the, the documents in the record, and this is, I think this is attached to the zoning. Well, no, it's, this is the- I just want to clear up. That seemed, that sounded a little confusing to me. So I just want to oh, be sorry. Clear. We <laughs> agree that there, you know, we, we don't dispute that there are three illegal units, you know, in existence there right now. We have no basis to refute that. It It's, you know, the zoning administrator's interpretation is that three units have not been maintained since 1995 and that, you know, the, the evidence seems to suggest that there was only yeah, that there weren't two additional units created pre-1995 and that there, you know, even if there was, there there was only one maybe created pre-1995, but even if there was one, they, they weren't maintained. Basically the two extra were not maintained. So in the, in the record that was provided this, there's a uh, April, 2010, uh, building permit application, and then there's three pages that are attached to that. And I did have a question about sheet one of that, if you're able to pull that up. I can. Uh, do you have a page number? So that would be page 20. It's 20, sure. The staff report. Sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit. There's a lot in here, so... Okay, let's see. Page 21. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the actual permit. Yes. Sorry. So it, there's a diagram of the basement. And if you look in the middle yes. of it, there's a, a note that says not a separate unit from the house. Is that something that would have been written by the applicant or is that a note that was added by staff? Um, generally, I mean, we don't, especially if the fact that it's handwritten, um, would probably, if they were at building services, and they would say, hey, you cannot have multiple units on this single family lot. They say this can only be that. Whether it was staff for themselves, I, I can't tell you exactly, right? but I would say generally, do we say, hey, you as the applicant, you need to write here that this is, that you recognize and understand that. I mean, I obviously wasn't there in 2010, so I can't make you <laughs> a promise that, but I would say that it's common standard and, okay. and that is their common practice. And it's something that we do, like I said, a lot of people have second kitchens. And so we do want to make sure that, hey, this is one single family dwelling and remains that way. And then going forward two pages, this is sheet three of three that's attached to that. There's another note that says on April 29th, 2010, by phone confirmed with Gary Riggler that structure functions as a single family dwelling, specifically that all parts of the structure are open to the others, that there are no separations, that it is not a duplex. It, any indication of where that note came from? Is that from an inspector? Um, it's attached to an actual inspection. So my guess is that it did come okay. from that, but um, but they're not, well, they're dated differently. So my guess is it probably someone in building services that had then made that determination that, um, that someone probably had called in and said, hey, what's going on here? Um, and somebody might have inspected and say, no, we verified that this is a single family dwelling, that it is open in between. And I'm speculating a little bit, but uh, I understand. I'm trying to make sense of the record as best I can. I have one last question, and this has to do. There was a, an arguments raised in the staff report regarding estoppel, and I wanted to make a make it clear that I understand. Is there a specific ruling or relief that the city is looking for with with respect to that estoppel argument? I mean, the relief is basically that, um, you know, to the extent, I, I think, 
I think implicit in some of Mr. Maxfield's arguments is that, you know, you should disregard what Ms. Schmidt represented and, you know, was trying to do through the basement and garage, you know, permit, you know, living space conversion process and allowing the um, car to be parked out front, which normally would not have been allowed by zoning, that you should disregard that. You know, she was a liar. She was renting this out the whole time. Um, we have other people that say she, we were renting from her. You know, you've heard from Mr. Maxfield that, oh, yes, yeah, she told us she was going to send us something in support of this unit legalization, but she's not doing that. Um, but I think that's a problem because that would allow Mr. Maxfield to basically benefit from, you know, allegedly Ms. Schmidt's, you know, fraud upon the city and that, you know, the property received a benefit in allowing the legalization of that garage conversion and basement to living space and allowing that car to be parked out front through the process that, you know, confirmed that that was a single family dwelling. And because of that, you know, we shouldn't be disregarding those representations at that time, because if that was not the case, then more parking would have been required, additional fire separation, additional thing, you know, building code things um, would have been required at that time to legalize them as separate dwellings. So that is this basically the city's estoppel argument. Thank you. I that's like I said, that's that's it from your questions from the city. Unless there's anything else the city wants to bring to my attention. I don't have anything further. Thanks. No. Not from me, thanks. Are there any members of the public that have that want to make a comment? If you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand, your digital hand, um, and I will unmute you so that you can comment. No hands are raised, uh, so we can proceed. So, uh, Mr. Maxfield, we'll turn the time back over to you if there's anything you'd like to say in response. Yes, I appreciate um, everyone's patience and help with this. As far as uh, improvements to the property, when I have legalized other units in the past, I have conformed with every safety issue and every uh, change that they needed, including adding off-street parking. I did that at 535. And it was difficult. I had to pump concrete over the house and I have to lose half my yard, but I did. And it's still there. And you can look at it and see that we did that. We do have an easement to the rear of this yard and we could do the same thing if that was required. Um, but it would require probably pumping again over the, the house and also would ruin part of the beautiful yard back there. So that's one of the reasons why we've chosen not to allow tenants to move in there that have cars. Um, we did have one tenant that lived in the basement unit that got a car after they moved in. They wanted me to help them get a permit. And I said, no, remember, we made the deal that if you were to move in here, you were not going to have a vehicle. We do not want to impact our neighbors. And so he's had to park uh, up above the sidewalk, right, on the property side to make sure he's not impacting the, the uh, street. He said, well, you can get a landlord parking permit, guest pass, and then I'll just use that. And I said, no. We made a deal when you moved into the property, you cannot impact the neighbors. So, and we have put in fire walls. We put in um, a fire fire alarms that are hardwired in. We have done aggressible windows. We have done everything that the city's ever asked us to do. And we do want everybody to be safe. And so we're not afraid of that kind of approach. And we would, we would welcome that opportunity to come in and uh, do whatever the city wants us to do to make sure that the property is safe and that our tenants will be safe and that the neighborhood will not be harmed by this these prop, these units in the property. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm, a, I'm aware of the parking issues. Uh, when they put in those islands out front of these properties, um, they wanted to put islands on 5th South to 6th South. And uh, that's where we have a lot of our properties. And there's one uh, three-story apartment complex up the street that has 12 units and they only have like four or five parking off street. 
And I said, if we put islands on 12 D's between 5th and 6th South, where, where are they going to park? And uh, so I voted with all of my properties to, to keep the islands out. And we still have 45 degree parking there. Thank goodness, because it is uh, an issue with the, the 12 unit property up the street. Anyway, um, I will I will do whatever I need to do, um, but I would would like to figure out a way to to try to keep the units in place um, if it's at all possible. So whatever I can do to help make that happen, I would be very willing to do it. Thank you. I want to thank both the, the appellant and the city for putting all the, the documents together and for answering the, the questions I had today. That certainly helps me better frame the issues. I would like to see the, the email comment that was submitted. I want to make sure that is also part of the, the record. And I'm going to take this under advisement and we'll be issuing a, a written ruling within the next 10 days. That comment will be in the file by the end of the day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. I know you guys are busy. It's after hours. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day. You Thanks, too. everybody. Thank you.